to do that. We also are letting the kids, um, our, we do have nursery for our youngest folks, but the kids are welcome to stay through the service. Um, so that also means some patience for all of us, which is um, always good to have. Um, but each, each kid is welcome to use one of these little books. Um, it does have the whole order of service in here. Um, it tells you the page number. Uh, parents, you may need to help a little bit with your kids turning the pages and finding where you're supposed to be. But we've got our blessings in here. We've got doodles. Um, well, especially, y'all need to start coloring now if you're able to. Um, the Peace of Christ, that will be part of our Peace of Christ later in the service. Um, and we have some doodles for the story of Ruth. We have um, some places to take notes for the sermon and all sorts of other things in here for the kids. And um, if anybody is worshiping live from home, we do have a link in the video as well for you to click on to follow along at home as well. Um, and you're welcome to take some of these home with you too if you'd like. Um, so that's today. Today is Blessing from the Backpacks. Um, we will have, we will not have Children's Church next Sunday, Labor Day weekend, um, but we'll start back up, I guess it will be the 19th of September, we'll have our next Children's Church, um, and then of course that week after that is our old Bluff Reunion, it's almost here. Um, that will be at 11 o'clock like it usually is, uh, the guest preacher is my husband Howard Dudley, Reverend Howard Dudley from First Presbyterian of Dunn. Um, I hope that you will, will join us for that very special service. At this time, we are having the meal after the service and everything. Um, and if anything changes with that, we will let you know. Um, are there any other announcements this morning? No, no. All right, hearing none, um, we will begin by calling ourselves to worship. Kids, if you want to follow along, it's on page three of your little booklet, um, and it is a special bouncing of the backpack call to worship. <laughs> Calling all children of the living God, the gospel is good news for every age and every stage. Let us worship together, the young and the old. The good news is proclaimed in God's words and also with crayons, silly songs, snacks, and rest time. Let, Let us worship, worship together, together every generation. After months of many learning behind screens or separated by 
Oh, yeah. That's where you probably go with your mommy to school, though, isn't it? I like that. that I bet that would be nice to do. I used to go to district. You did go to district. Um, now, so we are, you guys have all sorts, you may not have much in your backpacks right now, but you use all sorts of different things in your backpack, don't you? You have crayons and pencils and, and, notebooks. and notebooks. And does anybody have computers? I know Lindsay has to use a computer. And headphones, yep. We got some headphones too. And some people might use iPads and other other things. So today what we're gonna do is bless your backpacks because that's something that you carry alongside you to school every day. Here, why not that makes sissy? Um because we want to bless your backpacks, but that also means we're blessing you guys as you go to school so that you always know that God is with you. And so our little tags that we have today say, God's got your back. So that will remind you that God's got your back all the time. So cool. You can talk to your cousin now. That is so cool that you're able to talk to people all the way across the country. She is 10 months old. That's so cute. That's so cute. All right, so we are going to remind ourselves that God has got our back by giving out these tags. And you know what? These tags are going to remind you of not just that God's got your back, but God has you no matter what you're doing, when you sit and as you stand, as you learn and as you play. Oh, here comes some other kids. We got some. Um, and in every fear, every time you're scared, God is with you too. And every time you celebrate, God is with you. Come on. We hope that this reminds you that you know that God, your friend, is always there with you. So that's what we are saying when we give you these tags that they bless you and bless you through your school year. So we're going to bless both of our both our children and our, our teachers. We have a lot of teachers in this church, um, a lot of people who work with, uh, with the the schools in some way, um, maybe not just teachers, but coaches and all that. And so um, we're going to do kind of an overall blessing. I will hand out these tags to the kids first, and then um, what we have left we'll give to some of y'all teachers. Um, but I will first give it to the younger folks, and then you guys, um, the teenagers that are kind of in, what well, we have one teenager up here. <laughs> our youth who are up in the, the back, um, y'all can come up and grab one. So, I hope that God is with you, that you know that God is with you as you sit and as you stand, as you learn, as you play, as you color and draw, and as you jump around on the playground, as you eat your lunch in the cafeteria, as you make new friends, and as you get to know your teachers and learn more about the world. There you go. Um, and here is one for Gray. Our, our high schoolers especially have kind of a different challenge this year as, as they um, are adjusting to life in school in, in a different way and being online and offline and whatever else that might look like for you and as you prepare for college. Here you got Maggie and Sarah. Um, let's see, I'm missing any kids. Let's put all the kids. Um, so that's our blessing for our kids. Uh, parents, if you want to just, I'll say the prayer, or teachers, if you want to just, uh, after I say the prayer, you can come up and pick it up as we as we move into the next phase of the worship service. Um, so I'm going to say a prayer over all of you all, okay? Let's pray. God of fresh starts and new beginnings, we bring ourselves, our big feelings, and our backpacks to you. Last year was different from what we expected. We couldn't see our friends or play on playgrounds. Some of us learned at home in masks six feet apart, or both. In all these changes, we have may have felt sad and alone. God, our friend who comforts us, Hold us close and wipe our tears. 
In our backpacks, we carry blank pages, sharpened pencils, and pointy crayons. And in our hearts, we carry big feelings, unanswered questions, and hopeful expectations. There are endless possibilities of what this new year might bring, of what we might learn, of who we might meet, and who we might become. God, our friend who is always with us, be with us through it all. Be with us as we ride the bus. Be with us as we walk. Be with us as we buckle seatbelts, zip up jackets, and tie shoes. However we get there and whatever we wear, bless this journey into something new. And for the grown-ups going back to school with us, God, be with them too. Thank you for our teachers, helpers, caregivers, and leaders for all that they do and help us learn and grow. God, our friend who's full of wonder, fill their hearts and bless their hands. Amen. Um, all right, so um, I will give this to our teachers. In case some of y'all didn't know, Casey is teaching this year at the preschool at First Presbyterian in Dunn. Um, so we're excited that we have a new teacher in our midst. Um, and Letty's going to be in, well, she's going to be in the toddler class. She won't be in the same school, but she'll be at the same school. Um, and we've got all sorts of teachers. Miss, um, Miss Melissa over here. Who else do we have? Um, and if, if y'all, uh, of course, be encouraging to all of our teachers and those who are trying to be flexible <laughs> this year um, and continue to pray for all of them. Um, all right, our big kids, if y'all will um, go and, here, do some of y'all have, have these? Did you get one of these, Leah? Okay, did you, you guys did get these. So if y'all will turn to page eight in your little booklet. If you're going back to parents, you can go back to your parents. And this has, says the phrase, peace be with you, um, and, or peace of Christ be with you. So if you have this, will you hold it up so that we can see it and pass the peace? And so how we're going to do this is our kids who have the books will stand up and say, peace of Christ be with you. And then everybody else will say, and also with you. Um, so if our kids will stand up and just say, peace of Christ be with you. You need your backpack? All right, Julia, you want to stand up too? Everybody can stand up and hold up and say, peace of Christ be with you. All right, we'll try this now that we've got everybody together. Let's try to say it at the same time. Peace of Christ be with you. And I'm also with you. Right now, y'all say, peace of Christ be with you. Peace, peace of Christ be with you. you. And we say, and also with you. Yeah. All right, so now our um, little ones can go back with Tara uh, to the nursery. And um, any of our, our kindergartners, um, pre-K folks can stay here in worship. And you can follow along in this little booklet as the worship service goes on. All right.
Now hear the good news of God's promise. You are washed clean by the living waters. By the power of the Spirit, all who call on the Lord will be saved. Thanks be to God. Amen. Oh. 
for sharing your gift and Bonnie for sharing yours as well. Um, let's go to God in prayer once again. Guide us, O God, by your word and your spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover your peace. Amen. Now, our scripture reading today comes from the book of Ruth, and it's chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. Um, if you are a kid in our midst, you have a little booklet with doodles in it for the story. If you'd like to follow along that way, I'm going to kind of hold it up for those of you who don't have a book um, in case you want to follow along too. I did not draw these doodles. These were actually drawn by Sarah R., who was our keynote speaker at the middle school Montreat conference. Um, she showed these as she was telling the story, and I thought I would, would share them with you, but kids are welcome to color in these pictures um, and, or just look at them to follow along. So the book of Ruth, we um, we have not actually, I realize I have not actually preached from that book the whole time I have been here, um, but it is one of my favorite books. It's a great story that many of you may know bits and pieces of, but um, I imagine you, not many of us have read through the whole the whole book to hear the whole story um, and thought about how much this story means to the story of the of the Jewish people of the of the Christian people. Um, because Ruth is actually part of Jesus's genealogy, um, Jesus's family line, and so this is important because of that. But it's also important because it shows us a lot about who God's character is in our lives too. So, from the book of Ruth, chapter one, listen now for the word of God. Now, during the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land. Page one has a shop with no food. Famine means there was no food. A man with his wife and two sons went from Bethlehem of Judah to dwell in the territory of Moab. Now the name of that man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife was Naomi. And the names of his two sons were Milan and Kilion. Now they were Ephratite Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah. And they entered the territory of Moab and settled there. Now, pretty early on, Elimech, Elimech, look, that's a, a mouthful. <laughs> Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died. And only she was left along with her two sons. And they took wives for themselves. They were Moabite women. The name of the first was Orpah. And the name of the second was Ruth. And they lived there for ten years. But then both of the sons, Milan and Kilion, also died. Only the woman was left, without her two children and without her husband. Then she arose along with her daughters-in-law to return from the field of Moab. Because while in the territory of Moab, she had heard that the Lord had paid attention to his people by providing food for them. So she left the place where she had been, and her two daughters-in-law went with her. They went along the road to return to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her daughters-in-law, Go turn back, each of you to the household of your mother, and may the Lord deal faithfully with you just as you have done with the dead and with me. May the Lord provide for you so that you may find security, each woman in the household of her husband. And then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voices and wept. But they replied to her, No, instead we will return with you to your people. And Naomi replied, Turn back, my daughters. Why would you go with me? Will there again be sons in my womb, that they would be husbands for you? Turn back, my daughters, go, for I am too old for a husband. If I were to say that I have hope, even if I had a husband tonight, and even more, if I were to bear sons, would you wait until they grew up? Would you refrain from having a husband? No, my daughters. This is more bitter for me than for you, since the Lord's will has come out against me. 
Now, they, when they lifted up their voices and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth stayed with her. And Naomi said, look, your sister-in-law is returning to her people and to her gods. Turn back after your sister-in-law. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to abandon you, to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people, and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die. And there I will be buried. May the Lord do this to me and more, so that even death separates me from you. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she stopped speaking with her about it. And so they went. They were going back. They went back to Bethlehem. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So we just went through most of the first chapter of Ruth just now, but I'll, um, as we go through the sermon, I will include the rest of the story. And we'll explore it a little bit more. Uh, Ruth is a beautiful, and maybe possibly boring in parts story, full of both trauma and hope. But also things that don't really mean a whole lot to us today, like the idea of gleaning and marrying the distant relative and all the complications of that. When we read Ruth today, though, thousands of years later, what I'm often struck with is that those themes are so easily translated to today, even when the, maybe the, the story is not as familiar. This story is from the ancient Hebrew scripture, and it reveals at least two key traits of God. It tells us that the God of all creation is concerned with the mundane affairs of humankind. With everyday life, with the inconsolable grief of an older widow who has now buried her sons, plus the broken heart of young women who have been unable to have children and who has now lost her husband. In addition, the story affirms that our hope in God is well placed. So we find ourselves in the midst of this relationship between these women, Naomi and Orpah. Orpah, by the way, who, in case you didn't know, some of you may have known this, was who or Oprah was named after, but they got the name wrong in the birth certificate. And so she was supposed to be Orpah, but she's Oprah instead. So that's a side back about Orpah. So she did exactly what her mother-in-law, Naomi, asked her to do. And that was because she loved her and knew that Naomi was looking out for her to go back to, to Moab. But Ruth, Ruth was different. Ruth loved her mother-in-law in a way that was different than Orpah. She loved her mother-in-law so much that she wanted to stay with her. She was part of this family already and wanted to stay part of this family no matter what it meant for her social status or her mother-in-law's social status. Remember last week how I talked about the Samaritan woman at the well who may have had to keep marrying relatives and that might have been why she had so many husbands? That was what it was like during Ruth's time as well, even years before, before that story with Jesus. After she lost her husband and Naomi had no sons to offer her, she would have had to either marry a near relative or go back home and see what might happen, which Orpah does, even though it was hard for her. She wept in the process. But Ruth said otherwise. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you stay, I will stay. And she did this not out of obligation, but because she saw that they belonged to each other. Just curious, did anybody use that verse as part of their wedding? Anybody? It's often used as a wedding passage. Um, I've always thought that was a little interesting since it's not a romantic verse. It's a verse between a mother-in-law and a, and a daughter-in-law. Um, but in some ways, it's kind of fitting for a marriage because it's not about 
about that romantic and passionate love that first brings two people together, the kind of love that brings them together in the first place, it's a loving kindness, one that sustains you, the love that connects people together as a community. Now, the word in Hebrew for that is hesed. Um, I want y'all to try to say that with me. Hesed. That's good. We'll try again. Hesed. You got to spit a lot when you say it, just as any good Hebrew word goes. The word in the book of Ruth um, extends beyond the in relationship between Ruth and Naomi. It's also, it describes the love of Orpah. It also describes the love of Boaz later on. The Hesed of Ruth is probably why this book is even in the Old Testament. That loving kindness that reaches beyond family, a love that our English language doesn't really explain all that well, a love that supports and lifts up one another. So our kids in their booklets have this question written down, but I also want want y'all to think about it too. There's a way for the kids to write it in a heart. If y'all turn to a page that has a big heart, that's where you would write it in. Um, if you've already written something in there, you, it's a fine, but I'm going to invite all people to kind of ponder this question for a moment. Who has been a Ruth in your life? Someone who has dropped everything to be with you in your time of need? Or say like a Naomi, Somebody who wanted you to be safe but took you in anyway. Who was your mentor, maybe your family. So ponder for just a moment in silence. You can write it down if you'd like or just think of it in your head. Um, and I'll ask you to share with your neighbors in a moment. So just, for, just pause for one moment. Now I invite you to share with your neighbors. You can either talk to the person right next to you, turn around to the pew behind you. Um, kids, feel free to show off your drawings if you'd like. Um, who's been a Ruth in your life? Someone who has dropped everything in your time of need? Or like Naomi, who wanted you to be safe but took you in anyway? So talk amongst yourself for a moment. Good 
good timing because folks who don't have to work and don't have food. So it's really good for widows especially because they get to do this thing called gleaning. You may have heard of that term before, but when a landowner was harvesting his field, they would allow the poor and widows to collect whatever was left over. So Ruth went to the field to collect leftover barley for her and Naomi. And it happened to be a rich relative's field named Boaz. The foreman knew that she was from Moab and told Boaz this and told him that she was there with Naomi. And Boaz was so drawn to Ruth that he allowed her to have the best barley and the water and that they would have lunch together. She was shocked because he really had no obligation to help her, even though she was family, because he, had, she, he was not obligated to help foreigners, and she was from Moab. While the Hebrews were obligated to help their own people, they were not obligated to help foreigners. This story may remind you a bit, maybe it's one of the, the people that you thought of was a stranger that had helped you or showed chesed to you. I think that's increasingly more rare these days, that strangers helping one another. We know that people are a lot more isolated. So I'm going to throw some statistics at you. Did you know that 25% of Americans report that they do not have a close friend? 71% of millennials and almost 79% of Gen Z respondents reported feeling lonely a significantly greater proportion than other generations. Loneliness can actually be seen on the brain. One study found, for example, that when mice, a social creature like us, are forced to live in a cage by themselves, it changes their brain's basic architecture and causes nerve cells to shrink. And a more recent study of what social distancing during the pandemic has been doing to humans identified that the neural underpinnings associated with isolation are similar to those of physical hunger. So to say that you're starving for contact isn't really far from reality to what is actually happening to your body. Loneliness can shorten our life expectancy. It can increase disease risks and dementia. So we know that we need other people, right? We need one another. But for whatever reason, that has not encouraged people to reach out to one another, to begin chatting on the subway or in a grocery store line. When we're in public, we still tend to isolate in a lot of ways. I think one thing that might change that is if we start living like we belong to one another. To so look to connect to those who we don't even know, and especially to those who we do know, our family and our Friends. And we see this example as we continue the story of Ruth with the story of Boaz, impressed with Ruth's story. He showed her favor and ended up with a bounty of barley. And they also became involved romantically. And he pursued her and she responded. Now there's all this sort of drama that I'm not going to try to explain about the closer relative to her was the more likely to um, get married to her, and he was a little bit more distant than the closest relative, and so he fought for her favor with this closer relative. Um, and so because of this, he was able to care for her. He was able to care for her and Naomi, who had been left alone. They ended up having a child together who was named Ovid, and Ovid's son was Jesse, who was David's father. So you see that connection to the future king through Boaz and Ruth. So as I said before, the story of Ruth has that one major theme. There is a Hebrew word that describes that theme, and it is hesed. This word that means loving kindness is also loyalty and faithfulness, born of a sense of caring and commitment. And we see it first with Naomi and Ruth, and then also with Boaz for taking in Ruth. Naomi was concerned with her daughter -in -law, daughters in laws and hoped that they'd find new husbands, even though she had no responsibility for them. 
Ruth remained with her and gave up her native land and religion and wanted to find support for Naomi. And Boaz took a commitment beyond what was required. He was eager to marry Ruth and redeem the family land and name. He knew they belonged to each other. That word, hesed. But above all, God manifested Hesed because all the individuals in the story were paid for their loyalty and found security and fulfillment. The family that was close to destruction found new life. So much so that Ruth is mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus, one of only four women who was mentioned in it. She is a descendant even though she comes from a foreign land and was a widow. The person of Ruth was vital to lead to the person of Christ. This seemingly simple story led to her making a difference in the face of history. Now you all thought of ways that other people had helped you along the way. Now I want to invite you to think of something that you can do to help others. The more specific, the better. It's not something that you have to share with anybody out loud, but our kids may find another heart in their booklet by the offering um, section of the book where you can write and draw something that you might be able to do to help others. I hope that you'll ponder what those things may be, how you can show Hesed to others in this time, especially in this time of need. How can your family be expanded to include others who aren't even related to you? How would you be remembered? How can you show others that you belong to each other, even if it might be hard? <coughs> even if you don't agree on what that might look like to each other? Even if you worry you'll offend someone, just like Ruth might have worried that with Naomi? You belong with each other. Ruth went with Naomi. Boaz took in Ruth, which then meant Naomi was welcome there too. They belonged to each other. And because of them, Jesus came along, and we all belong to Jesus. We belong to each other. And that means this life isn't just about me, myself, and I. It's about us together. The world will try to convince us that this life is just about how cool I am or how far I'm getting ahead. But that's not the message of Scripture. The message of Scripture is that you and I, we are bone of bone and flesh of flesh. We belong to each other. I'm going to ask y'all to repeat after me for this last line. We belong to each other. We belong to each other. Where you go, I go. Where you go, I go. Where you stay, I stay. Where you stay, I stay. Amen. Um, and friends, as we are reminded that we belong to one another and to Christ Jesus, let us stand and sing him 304, Jesus Loves Me, This I Know.